Welcome, welcome, Chicago House Book Clubbers. It's good to see you all um, for yet another fantastic conversation of CAST by Isabel Wilkerson. I want to apologize in advance for my voice. It's really hoarse. I guess I've had one too many martinis during COVID-19 and my voice is taking a hit. But um, so please bear with me. But I'm absolutely thrilled to be with you all. Uh, for not only to discuss this fabulous book, which you don't have to read to participate since the conversations are based on theme, but we also are incredibly honored to have two phenomenal human beings join us this evening. And that's Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton and newly appointed State Senator Mike Simmons. So, but before we dive into that, just wanna provide a super brief a uh, recap of section six, I believe it is, that we're discussing tonight. And some of, the <clears throat> some of the themes that Wilkerson talks about that we can dive into this evening are about how caste shows up in our politics, in terms of the political infrastructure, who's running, why people vote, how they vote, why some people don't vote, et cetera. Uh, the Trump election and what that says about our caste system in this country and also the price that we all pay for caste. So not just those at the bottom or toward the bottom of the caste system, but actually how it impacts all of us as human beings, even those who think that they are immune from the negative impacts of caste. So I think that there's a lot of juicy conversation um, for that. So I'm really excited about it. And uh, on that note, I'll turn it over to Nabila to introduce uh, the Lieutenant Governor, and then I'll introduce Mike. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I actually want us to get launched right into, um, into the discussion. So into the chat group, I am actually putting uh, the Lieutenant Governor's bio, and all I'm gonna say here is that she is just a remarkable, remarkable woman. Um, a lawyer by training, and it feels like consensus builder by passion. Um, she is the 48th Lieutenant Governor of this wonderful state, and we are just thrilled to have her. And the only reason that I'm not going through all of her reams and reams and reams of qualifications and, and, and attributes is I want to save time for us to, to have a chat. So welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Excellent. Well, th oh. thank you so much, Nabil, for that uh, warm introduction. And thank you for posting in the chat, because I think that's what I'm going to be doing from now on. You could read it in the chat so that we can get going with our conversation. I love that. And thank you to you and Kelly for hosting uh, tonight's important conversation about race, class, and gender. I'm really am just thrilled to be a part of it. I wanna thank Tyler and the Chicago House staff for organizing this event and working so graciously with my team to make it happen. And I also would love to give a wonderful warm welcome to the newly uh, appointed State Senator, Mike Simmons. Uh, so thrilled to have you, not just in this conversation tonight, but so thrilled to be working alongside of you in Springfield for the residents of your district, as well as for all of the people of Illinois. And to all of the book clubbers, I'm excited to be with you here tonight to share the love of a good book and the discussion that goes along with it. I really do wish that I had more time to read for pleasure. But one of the things that I wanted to say as I open up is that there is a book that I have been reading for a number of weeks now because I just can't get through it uh, with my time and schedule. And that book happens to be Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. So the fact that I get to discuss it tonight and learn from all of you is I'm just so grateful because this book has been, it's very heavy. It is very painful at times, but it is also a necessary book. And the way that Isabel Wilkerson writes her words so eloquently, it just draws you right in. Cast is one of the harshest and most polarizing words in any language. And it means to put people in what someone else or what society deems to say, put them in their place. And oftentimes their place is uh, isolating, it is limiting, it's discriminatory, it is polarizing, and 
oftentimes, of course, it is dehumanizing. And to make anyone feel this way is completely unacceptable. And if America lives up to its promise, we must all embrace one another's humanity, value ideas, beauty, culture, perspective, and the unique gifts that each of us bring. And we must make room in every space for the very lived experiences and narratives that we have that allow each of us to be our authentic selves. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation because much of the work that I do in our administration uh, is through a restorative justice lens. And I know you all know what restorative justice is. It's really rooted in indigenous um, people who understood that when harm has been done one to another or harm by a system to a community or harm by failed policies that affect residents through generations, we have to bring people together and tap into the wisdom that's in the room that's found in our communities. The solutions are found by lifting up the wisdom that's found in our communities. And that's how we can really help to repair the harm that has been done. So tonight's book that we're talking about is, and you've been talking about, as I said, is painful, but it is honest. And uh, I really look forward to talking about tonight how this caste system is not by accident, but it has been through intentional policies, through things like chattel slavery, Jim Crow laws, lynching, redlining, uh, restrictive covenants, barrier after barrier after barrier that causes um, people to feel like they are, as indicated in the book, at the bottom of the rung. So I look forward to this conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Excellent. That's Thank so you. wonderful. We're really kind of looking forward to, to digging back into your comments and your introduction. But before that, maybe if Kelly can introduce uh, uh, the senator, we'll, uh, we'll get started. Yes, and so um, like Nabila, I put um, State Senator Mike Simmons bio in the chat, but I would be remiss if I didn't also say how thrilled I am that he's with us. I met Mike um, be, uh, through a dear friend, a mutual friend of ours, Kim Hunt. And it was several years ago that we met and um, like what the year after we first met, um, I uh, was interviewing for a job in the mayor's office and Mike with his political experience policy, the fact that he used to work in the mayor's office, he really took me under his wing, mentored me. We became really good friends. We have so much in common. And Mike, I just wanna say that I've learned so much from you. I never cease to be absolutely stunned by your humanity and brilliance and compassion and conviction. Uh, I also had the honor of meeting your mother on a few occasions, and I have no doubt that she's incredibly proud of you, and I know that you're also proud of her. And so I'm really excited that you are representing Illinois' seventh district, but I think it's a gift to the entire state because of not only your skills and your talent, but also your character and your kindness and, and your experience in policy and advocacy and um, in politics and also an entrepreneur with Blue, Ky Blue Sky Strategies. You founded your own uh, company that really helps so many organizations and groups in terms of equitable anti-racist public policy. And um, I can't think of a better person to be in the seat of state senator. So first of all, thanks for not only being a fantastic advocate, but also a dear friend and an amazing Chicagoan. So welcome state senator Mike. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, I, I literally am just like choked up right now. I can't even talk. You got me there now. Um, I, I um, Thank you so much. I'm just so honored to just be, be your friend, Kelly. Everything that you said about me, I could, I could talk an equal length about what you've meant to me and my per professional and personal journey. Um, and I wanna thank you for, for even thinking of me to, to join this group tonight and talk about such an important topic as racial caste. Um, I definitely wanna extend a thanks to Chicago House, uh, Nabila Rashid, Lieutenant Governor. So good to be here with you this evening and talking about such an important and urgent topic. Um, and I um, am just so, I'm just so humble. Kelly, it's, so, it's just so, Interesting to just be sitting here with you because you and I could be having this conversation just like on the weeknight, right? And we have, right? Just talked about all this stuff for so many years and 
the Juneteenth celebrations at, at my living room and all that kind of stuff, right? It's just the world is getting small really fast. And so um, it's just an honor to be here. And um, I thank you. you. You put the bio in the chat, so I won't, I won't recap my background. That's, it's, it really is. It's, it's wonderful having you, you both here. And I think, so the format today, what we're going to do is we're going to have um, three short questions uh, uh, back and forth. I think the first question I'm going to pose to um, the Lieutenant Governor and then Kelly uh, will, will uh, 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 approach the Senator with a question and then I'll ask the third question, which, which we'll send to both of you. And then I think at that point, we'll open it up to the broader group because I we would like um, others to, to to jump in as well and so um, Lieutenant Governor you 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 uh, mentioned you, you touched upon restorative justice and you you touched upon you know sort of like how um, you know, restorative justice is at the core of what you do and what you believe um, your office has focused in the past on rural communities. And I was wondering whether you can address how your office addresses this issue of caste and racial inequity um, in both the rural and urban areas. And you know, what does that look like? And how do we how how does your office approach it? Yeah, so I think that the way that we approach it in general is first and foremost to illuminate the fact that there is caste and racial inequality that exists in both urban and rural communities all across the state of Illinois, and then to be very intentional about thinking about these areas. I think that because of the way that, you know, I was born and raised on the south side of Chicago, still live on the south side of Chicago, and if I were to be honest, and I do try to stay as honest as I can be about these conversations that we are having, I didn't spend a lot of my life traveling throughout the state of Illinois. Um, and I have learned so much and decided to be very intentional about traveling the entire state, going to rural communities, learning about agriculture, learning about communities that are very different from mine, but also asking those important questions about why why do we see some of the disparities that we see racial or otherwise as we think about our entire state? Mm -hmm. So Governor Pritzker signed an executive order very early on in our administration establishing what's called the Justice, Equity and Opportunity Initiative. It is housed in my office and under my leadership and has really showed me and given me a platform to really grapple with this idea of what justice really means, recognizing that you cannot have real justice without equity and opportunity. So what does justice really mean? What is justice? And I think that's a question that I think about as I read this book. You know, some hear the word justice and what immediately comes to mind is policing, jails, prisons. That's what's considered justice. And that's certainly true that that's a part of what we talk about when we consider justice. But when we think about the entire state, urban communities and rural communities, what we really come to understand is that justice is not just policing jails and prisons. Justice is access to affordable housing and health care. Justice is um, making sure that you have healthy and nutritious food, which um, we know that there's been an increasing need in the midst of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Justice is economic opportunity. It's being able to drink clean water and breathe clean air. And justice is about access to a quality education regardless of the zip code that you live in. So our JEO initiative is fighting to uh, really expanding the fight to justice to really be more inclusive around where do we connect the dots about what's happening in our um, in our urban communities that is also happening in our rural communities. When I look, think about what's happening in communities, both urban and rural, we know that there is a digital divide that sometimes we hear about in rural communities that don't have access to broadband internet access, but that is also happening on the south and west sides of the city of Chicago in black and brown communities that don't have access to uh, the internet. How did that play out in the midst of a pandemic? When I think about issues such as um, opioid uh, overdose, o opioid overuse and disorders, um, we see the same increase during this pandemic that disproportionately impacts 
Black men ages 50 to 59 that are disproportionately dying from opioid use disorders. But opioid use disorders is not just on in, in black and brown communities, it's also in our rural communities. When we think about issues such as food insecurity, which I mentioned before, some people think, well, rural communities where they're more agricultural communities don't have an issue with food insecurity. We see that in both urban and rural, rural communities. So I chair the Governor's Rural Affairs Council and in all the work that I do as a restorative justice practitioner, I am trying to connect the dots around the fact that we can either point the fingers and say, well, that's an issue here and it's not over there or you don't know what I'm dealing with, or we can find the ways and say, look, we're all dealing with this regardless of our geographical area. And if we're really going to attack systemic racism and the caste system, we will have so much more power if we come together and recognize what we can do if we say, you know what, we're all dealing with these things and we need to fight them together. Oh my gosh, there is just, whew, that was fantastic. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Ooh, there's a there's a lot to sit with there. Thank you, uh, State uh, Senator Mike. I have a question for you. So, um, Lieutenant Governor touched on how caste can show up uh, in urban and rural communities. I know that you've you've you grew up in the city and you've spent the majority of your time fo focused on things taking place in Chicago and in, uh, in the city in particular. In addition to policy, public policy broadly. You've worked a lot in housing and neighborhood and economic development as well. So the question I have for you is, what does anti-racist urban planning look like? And what about anti-racist public policy? And if, if I could also tie it to a theme in the book here, how do you think anti-racist public policy not only benefits the people to, at the bottom, of the caste system, particularly in terms of race and socioeconomics, but everyone, including people toward the top and at the top of the caste system. Thank yeah. you. Uh, it's a great question. Um, so with equitable urban planning, anti-racist urban planning, what we're really talking about in Chicago is getting at the root of gentrification and displacement. That's really where that was born from. When I started Blue Sky Strategies, which is my firm, that allows me to develop anti-racist public policy for stakeholders. It was in the midst of a city that is rapidly changing. I come from the north side of Chicago, Lincoln Square, grew up in public housing. And so I've seen, had a very unique perspective in terms of the change and the excessive upward pressure on rents. Um, and people who were here 20, 30 years ago, who can, oh, this is just no longer accessible for them. So what I'm doing when, when working on anti-racist uh, urban planning is creating frameworks for uh, de for developers, for nonprofit organizations, for foundations, mostly it's foundations that really are interested in this. Um, and frankly, a, a whole host of community leaders um, and people who are ordinary people who feel this stuff in their bones, they understand what, it, what it's like to watch your rent go up two and $300 or shop owners, right? Like both of my parents were small business owners who are watching the storefront to the, the right and left of them go vacant because somebody couldn't afford to, to run a shop that's been there for 20 or 30 years old, cake shop or barber shop or um, another mom and pop business. So essentially what I'm doing there is taking my urban planning expertise, right? The, the stuff that you learn about when you're in their neighborhood planning and doing the, the work behind the scenes and taking it out to the community and then educating the community on what kind of options there are to have urban planning that centers them and centers their needs, right? Because at the end of the day, Anti-racist urban planning is about acknowledging that racial caste is, is embedded in all of the power structures of our society. That is, that is automatically going to be a beast that lives there, and we have to name it, address it, and we have to know how to work around it so we can break through it. And so as somebody who grew up in a community where I've seen how the, the um, rapid change in the city has negatively impacted so many people, I'm building that expertise both at the urban planning level but as the Lieutenant Governor said in the lived experiences, right, just literally knowing how this is playing out and how this impacts local people and to the urban planning strategies that I would develop for, for stakeholders across the board. Um, and so, you know, to give you a concrete example of public policy, right, it's looking at the whole debate around, around, around justice reform. And I, I almost struggle with the, word, the right word to even use for this, because when we talk about criminal justice reform, I think, well, there are a lot of people who end up in the justice system, or I would even prefer to say the carceral system, um, that shouldn't have been there to begin with, right? If we'd had those good restorative justice programs up at the front, 
or those equitable investments up at the front that the Lieutenant Governor talked about, a whole lot of people, a whole generation of people wouldn't have ended up in the carceral system to begin with. And so anti-racist public policy is about being, being um, intentional about talking about those structure, the structural racism that embeds those systems and being able to talk about it in clear terms for people, right? When we talk about the debate around cash bail, right? This is just talking to, to regular people about what it means to come from a family where somebody, or you're making $9,000 a year if you're lucky. And so you get locked up and you don't have a way to pay bail. You don't have a way to get back in the community precisely because you don't have money. And then you get into the whole thing around why don't you have money? Well, what's the housing situation? Uh, what's the economic situation? And so it's, it's just going through all of that work and then having the policy debate um, in a completely different way than you otherwise would have. So it's just redefining the terms so that people are a lot more educated around um, the caste system that we know embeds all of our structures. And, 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 and the, uh, I like the other part of the question too, how it benefits people at the bottom of the top. I mean, it's just, it's just collective empowerment, right? I, I like to think that people who um, are maybe wealthier or don't come from communities where mass incarceration is right outside your door. I would like to think that their hearts are in the right place and they wanna do the right thing. They don't like living in a society where um, we have a, a prison system that disproportionately uh, incarcerates black and brown people that they don't, they don't like going to sleep with that. And so if they understand the options with an anti-racist framework, right? They can advocate for better policies. They can hold their elected officials accountable in a whole different way. And that works really well for them. And then everybody else is, is caught up in the system. And so they're benefiting from that as well. Yeah, that's, I, I think that's the, the notion that a rising tide will float all boats, regardless of size, regardless of, you know, sort of like shape. That's the notion, right? Is, is we, have to, we have to bring everyone up. And, and it, it's about, you know, sort of like leveling the playing field and, and making sure that everyone has, has equal access to those opportunities. Um, um, I think uh, early on in uh, the pandem pandemic, Lieutenant Governor, um, the data showed that COVID-19 cases um, and the deaths disproportionately affected uh, Black and Latinx communities. And, and, and that's actually seen across the board, not just in the United States. We, we talk a fair amount about the BAME community in, in Britain, and it's the same is true there, that the, the Black and Asian American and minorities communities are, are very much disproportionately affected, uh, not just by COVID, by, but by, by vaccine access as well, access to treatments. Um, what does this racial inequity across Illinois look like now, both as the pandemic and the vaccine rolls out, um, and as those efforts increase, and how do we bear that in mind and how is it playing out? Mm -hmm. um, well, so first of all, let me just begin by saying that I know that there are a number of people participating in tonight's conversation that do a lot of work very close to communities and are embedded in communities and connected to communities, uh, oftentimes marginalized communities. And so I wanna start by um, just offering my condolences because if you are, in a community, if you represent a community of color, if you're in a black and brown community or working very closely, you know someone mm -hmm. who has uh, probably died from COVID. I certainly know more than one person who has died from COVID. This pandemic has um, taken the lives of over 22,000 members of our Illinois family. And so I just wanted to begin by, you know, when we hear that, sometimes we hear these numbers and it becomes kind of just what you see on the news or through your Twitter thread, but we also have to pause sometime and recognize the loss, the fact that we are all grieving. We are grieving a lot of different things right now, but we're certainly grieving as well, the loss of loved ones and friends and family members that has, and it has disproportionately impacted black and brown communities as you, as you have indicated. You know, there was something that I read today in the Washington Post um, a little bit before we joined this call that just floored me. I paused and just, it just struck me. It said today that black people in America have lost nearly three years of life expectancy since this pan pandemic began. So since we're not even at one full year yet since the stay at home order, but we are about a year since the pandemic started, 
And black people in this country have lost three years off of their life expectancy compared to 1.9 years for the Latinx community and 0.8 years for, the, for whites. That is a travesty. And it is a reflection of the fact that systemic racism is killing us. Yes, this pandemic is also deadly, but this pandemic did not start the uh, racial inequities that we see. These are, as the, the Senator said, these have been embedded in the systems, every single system that exists in our country, built from a foundation of racism that has gone through this system uh, throughout generations. So um, yes, we have been most at, at risk because we often are the essential workers who have been on the front lines um, and lots of other factors that come into play that are also based in systemic racism, racism access to health care, and lots of other things. Um, but I would say that, you know, our goal here in the state of Illinois from the very beginning was to make sure that first when it came to testing, that we made sure that we targeted our efforts to black and brown communities, making sure that we had bilingual workers at the different facilities, that we were in communities to make sure people could get tested. Um, and that in result led to us having one of the lowest positivity rates in the country. Um, in terms of the vaccine, we have continued to prioritize equity. Are we where we want to be? Absolutely not. We know that we uh, are working very hard and certainly are very grateful that we now have leadership at the federal government to really help with a coordinated plan to distribute vaccinations. But right now, our state's population is about 14% Black and about 18% Latinx. And we're getting, uh, we are not reaching that proportion of uh, vaccinations. And there's lots of reasons for that. And again, many rooted in systemic racism, including the fact that that, you know, and I don't think that this is the totality of the issue, but there is a lack of distrust from many from communities of color. I don't think that that's the sole reason, but I think that that's one factor because of how in the midst of systemic racism, so many community, communities of color have been treated by the healthcare field. So we are expanding our vaccination uh, sites all throughout. We have deployed 800 members of the National Guard to make sure that they are administering vaccinations all throughout the state. We're partnering with pharmacies like Walgreens and CVS. And then we're also enlisting providers to make sure that in the communities that are the hardest hit, we have some real credible messengers to make sure that they get the, work, the word out. So we are doing what we can to try to reduce the disparities, but we are not giving up yet. We know, the governor and I both know that there's a lot more that we need to do. Um, and I think that the good news is uh, that we can see the light at the end of the, at the tunnel. Um, we heard President Biden say over the last week that by July, every uh, American should have access to a vaccine. Uh, I think we still have a lot of work to do to make sure that people understand why it's so important and that they can make informed decisions about whether they decide to get the vaccine or not. Yeah, I, I, uh, thank you for that. That's a, that's a great response. I think that the education component and the healthcare education component is, is so important and so relevant to how quickly we can, we can um, we can get, get, get this virus under control. Um, and, and that statistic, I read that statistic this morning as well. And the last time that there was a loss, there was such a dramatic loss in life expectancy was actually in response to the 1918 um, uh, uh, flu epidemic, uh, mm -hmm. pandemic. Um, and the hope is that we will go back and, you know, sort of like those losses that we have incurred that, that you know, life expectancy will go back up after, um, uh, after we've had an appropriate rollout, but that appropriate rollout requires everyone to get vaccinated. Um, Senator, perhaps if I can um, reiterate the question to you, um, again, you know, what does racial inequity across Illinois look like now that uh, both the pandemic and the vaccine rollout efforts are on the increase. Perhaps you can uh, give us your perspective on that. Yes, I mean, I, I would really just double click pretty much everything that the Lieutenant Governor said. I mean, this really comes down to, um, you know, just the, you, you're really relying on a lot of the infrastructure that's already out there to have an effective and equitable vaccine distribution. And so all of the 
inequities that we know already exist in the healthcare system are front and center when we're trying to trying to actually do that distribution strategy. And so, you know, this really is going to take an aggressive effort um, to, you know, lean on all of our, you know, credible messengers to get out there and talk to people about what the stakes are, right? Because I, I understand, I understand like people that are, are a little nervous about this. I personally was a little nervous about it in this end probably still am on some level. Um, and I think we all are, right? I mean, the, this is something that most of us have never lived through, um, black, white, or everybody in between. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the most um, extreme pandemic that we've had in over a hundred years. And so we all are scared. Mm -hmm. And so I would, I would say that, you know, we really obviously are really leaning on the federal government to, to make that uh, end of July timeline. Like all of, I feel, I feel like all of what we're doing at the state level depends on the federal government getting that part of it right. And I feel like the goodwill is there from the Biden administration and that, that part will happen. But we can't succeed if we don't have that, that partnership. And so it's, it's important to, to say that. Um, but then I think it's just, it's just being, anticipating those inequities that exist in the medical system where in some parts of Chicago on the South and West side, the hospital systems are, are so overstressed. Um, mm -hmm. And some of the safety net hospitals are frankly in danger um, of even operating. And so we have to be anticipating that um, we have to really be le leaning on the community health clinics that are out there that are already doing so much great work with, with the people that we need to get vaccinated. Um, and um, many of that, the people that are in that community are the people that historically are underserved by the healthcare system. And so the, the extra work and extra effort um, and, and frankly, just really good ground game, ground game coordination is going to be vital. And we see this in the 7th District, too. I mean, we've got a, a sizable percentage of undocumented immigrants in this community whose access to health care is tenuous at best. Um, and so, you know, we don't have we don't even have full Medicaid coverage of a lot of that population. And so that that's a legislative effort that I want to get behind this session that really helps to close the equitable um, access of health care for that population. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, just frankly, looking at a lot of our um, essential workers who already are, are so, sort of don't have a have a whole lot of extra hours in the day and making sure that the vaccine distribution efforts are, are targeted in a smart way where they'll be able to actually access that care. Um, I was over at Weiss Hospital the other day, uh, just outside of the 7th District, and I was talking to the hospital administrators there about this very topic. And the good thing is that they already are thinking about this stuff and building it into their efforts. Yeah, it, I, I think it does. It's going to take a concerted effort from, from the multiple stakeholders, both, both within the community as well as in the medical profession and in government. And that is, um, you're absolutely right. We, no one has lived through this in, you know, sort of like in, in any of our lifetimes. And um, it is an opportunity for us to, um, again, redress the imbalance. Um, and we've got to get it right. Um, and, and as the Lieutenant Governor says, thankfully, right now, we've got, we've got people at the helm that, um, that at least understand the exigency of, 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 of the matter. Whereas for the last, you know, last year we didn't. Um, so I think that's a, that's a, 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 a huge help. Um, I, I wanted to uh, turn it over to Tyler and the rest of the team to see if we've had, um, had any questions come up um, um, or whether there are, um, yes. or whether we can just, you know, keep going. Keep going, yeah. Um, let's see here. Yeah, I have a couple of questions handy, um, but also totally open if you all want to keep the conversation going. No, go ahead. Ask, ask yeah. your question and we'll, we'll all jump in, I'm sure. Absolutely. Uh, the question is to the Lieutenant Governor. Uh, can you tell us about the work of Healing Illinois and how has that changed during the last year? Ooh, well, you know, there's a saying in the restorative justice world that hurt people hurt people. Mm -hmm. uh, what I also like to focus on is that healed people heal people. And there has been a lot of hurt and harm and trauma uh, over the last, I mean, I could go beyond the last year of this pandemic and go beyond that, and, but there's just been a lot of trauma that people have been experiencing. And certainly it's been exacerbated by this pandemic where people have been so isolated, so disconnected. Um, and we recognize that we are facing not one pandemic, but two, maybe even three, certainly the pandemic of COVID-19, but also the pandemic of systemic racism and also the economic uh, impact that this has all uh, borne. So it is, um, 
it is clear that there are a lot of people that are hurting. Uh, and when I think about what happened this summer when uh, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, and what makes me sad is that whenever I start naming those names, I recognize that we don't have enough time to really go through the list of all of the many hashtags and names, and they're not hashtags, they're people that become memorialized through a hashtag and what that meant. So that on top of the pandemic, on top of everything else, led us to start thinking about what can we do? Even what we just saw recently with the attack on our US Capitol that was incited by the former president of the United States and what that felt like as we were all watching this happen in real time on television. These are things that cause a lot of trauma. And when you can't connect with people, you know, I love the fact that we can do this virtually and it's, it's great to see your faces and to at least have some semblance of connection. But I miss being in the room with you all. I miss the energy that comes from being and sharing space together. So what we did is, again, through a restorative lens is that we created what's called Healing Illinois, uh, really in response to the trauma that we have seen. You hear a lot of times people say, well, we need to begin the healing. And it's like, hold up, before we start healing, we got to tell the truth. Truth telling is a prerequisite really in my mind to the real healing process because otherwise you're putting a band-aid on something that really requires a tourniquet. So, you know, as we've put out some funding, $4.5 million in some of the CARES Act uh, poverty relief funding that's being um, given in grants from ranging from five to $50,000 to community organizations all across the state of Illinois to really create safe spaces for people to really begin the dialogue around racial healing and equity and really thinking about topics like systemic racism and how it plays out in the workforce and what kind of training do we need to do for our team and our employees. Um, so there's more information with our Department of Human Services. Um, the, a few other things that we've done really to focus on what we can do in addition to the Healing Illinois grants is that um, our office, my office worked alongside with Cook County and the city of Chicago to do some equity um, training, uh, equity kind of, uh, it was more so like a seminar to really focus on leaders in state, city and county levels of government to really talk about equity and how we embed it in policy making as we have talked about in this conversation. So, you know, we're doing this work um, but it is something that requires some real intention. And I, I know uh, Senator Simmons and I both have indicated that this is not something that just happens haphazardly. You know, we saw people in the streets peacefully protesting, crying out. And certainly I wanna acknowledge the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus that came boldly and courageously with four pillars to really root out systemic racism in our state and got three of those four pillars passed this lame duck session. And I look forward to continuing to work alongside the Black Caucus. But the bottom line is we are in a moment in time where so many things are converging. And this is the moment that we must do something. Uh, people are tired of just saying, well, we'll get to it, we'll get to it. Meanwhile, the wealth gap continues to increase. Meanwhile, the trauma continues to increase. Meanwhile, the life expectancy continues to increase uh, the differences at least or the disparities. So we're doing work to heal so that we can come together and do the real hard work together to move our state forward. Thank you for that, Lieutenant Governor. Um, there's another question for you uh, from the chat. Okay. So Lieutenant Governor, as someone originally from, so this is a question posed by someone. Lieutenant Governor, as someone originally from Southern Illinois, I know there are a lot of white people, many of whom are impoverished, who are very resistant to racial equity. As someone who represents a state with such diverse points of view, how do you address pushback? Yeah, you know, I think, um, thank you for that question. Uh, First of all, let me just say, as the Lieutenant Governor, I represent all close to the 13 million people of our state. 
There has never been a black lieutenant governor in our state's 200 year history. And even that is a result of the caste system. And there's a reason for that. You know, there, and I think about some of the barriers. I think about black people who were in Southern parts of our state, who because of sundown towns and other reasons and violence were pushed out being told you can't be in this community after when it gets dark outside and so and and there were violent responses and so people moved into some of our cities much like people through the great northern migration uh came to places like chicago from this from the south because of violence and lynching so it goes back to what i said of first and foremost recognizing the truth the truth is not often talked about the truth is not often told the full history is not often told and we have to make sure that, and I know that there are a lot of efforts, including through the push of the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus to make sure that black history is being told so people can understand your community did not end up being homogenous just by accident. It was, in, there were intentional policies, practices, and uh, real barriers that were put up that kept others out. So that's one thing. I think the other thing that I would say is that um, I try to get to as many communities as I can to listen to what it is that has um, that often divides us. You know, I think there's power as a restorative justice practitioner to be able to listen, because as I said before, hurt people hurt people. And so there's some things that you have experienced that might also cause you to be exclusive exclusionary as well. And then, as I said, I also try to find points to connect us to say, you know what, I know you think this is an issue just for you, but I've got some other communities that are dealing with the same thing. Having said that, having said that, uh, I think that we are grappling, all of us as a nation right now, with this concept of people who genuinely don't want you to exist. And and whether and, and what is the real hope for trying to bring reconciliation in those spaces? It is a very tough dis discussion. And I, I'm appreciative that we are doing things like Healing Illinois that has created spaces all throughout the state to be able to come together and say, let's really, the good, bad, and ugly, let's talk about this. Let's talk about race. Let's bring it to the forefront. I wanna point out, by the way, that when we were protesting, uh, and we saw these protests all around the world in relation to uh, George Floyd's murder mm -hmm. and Breonna Taylor's murder. It was not just big cities. There were small towns all across the state of Illinois, small towns where they had never had any protest. And I just want to applaud them because it took a lot of courage to stand up in spaces where people are not necessarily pro you know, racial equity. And I just wanna applaud the people because that's what it takes. It takes someone having the courage to say, I know I may just be one of a few, mm -hmm. but right is right. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to allow us to be a community that says, that, that demonstrates that black lives don't matter. I'm gonna make sure that I stand up. Now, after you protest though, you've gotta keep the work going and the education going. So. That's what I try to do. I try to build relationships all across the state so that in those relationships, I can then educate and, and bring some clarity to the issues. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a wonderful um, uh, response to that, to that question. I, um, I wanted to um, uh, go back to the Senator for a minute and um, just, you know, sort of like ask whether, well, don't, I'm gonna, I, before you joined, we said you don't need to have read the book to, to be a part of this conversation. So I'm not sure whether, um, whether, whether you've read the book or not, but throughout the book, there is this, this notion of um, anti-racism and colorism and stratification. You know, one of the, and, and I, I bring this stratification notion up every single week because it, it you know, we have finally gotten to a point where we're being provided the vocabulary to have these conversations. Um, and I think 
that's what's critical about this book is that it lays out in a very succinct form the the, the definitions that we need to progress this conversation forward. So I was just wondering if you if you have read the book, whether you have um, you know particular insights that that you gained out of this book, and that you know sort of like you'd you'd like to discuss further. Yes, uh, you know it's a wonderful question. Um, I, I did read the book right actually auspiciously right before the appointment. This was a book I finished at the end of December. So I, I don't know if I would have been able to read it this session, um, but I did I did manage to complete it right before I suddenly became a public official. Um, and I think it was really good uh, reading for the role that I have right now. Um, you know, I think what uh, to answer your question, what it made me think about as I read it and what I'm still really, really struggling with is if it's if, if we take Dr. Wilkerson's argument at face value that racial caste is built into the structure of this country, right? And I don't even know that that's an argument anymore. I think that is starting to become patently obvious to yeah. a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, then, you know, what does this say about the American dream, right? I mean, this is, this is something that I struggled with as I read the book, just a sense of, you know, is, is the American dream real and accessible uh, for people who are ordered at the bottom of this caste? Um, with, with Dr. Wilkerson clearly saying that Black people are ordered at the bottom of the racial caste system. And she gives so many en endless examples from Plessy v. Ferguson on down to the treatment of our first black president, right? When he was in the White House, right? And just how this caste system is it's just predictable. Um, and how, frankly, we had an opportunity, you know, my mother's African-American, my great grandparents were, were uh, during a great migration came up from Mississippi and Georgia, right? The reason they had to leave the South is because the first, um, the first reckoning that this country had in the 1860s and 70s it was ended in the political deal in 1877. My great great grandparents were supposed to get land. They were supposed to get the access to their own labor, and they were supposed to be able to, to stand and run for office, much like I'm, I'm now a state senator and and and, Ju and and we have lieutenant governor and other members of the general assembly. And so there's this impatience I feel where I look at I look at the history and timeline in this country, and I think to myself, you know, what if we had got it right the first time, right? What would that have meant for my mother? Who struggled with healthcare access to healthcare her whole life? What would this have meant to my for my grandmother, who was working sixteen hour jobs as a department store clerk and as a substitute teacher, and still couldn't feed her kids? Right, like you just start to think about it like that, and it really sobers you up. It's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I put my name in to run for office and and to be a state senator because I said I've got a this is an opportunity where I can step in here and I can help to sort of reshape the debate um, and bring us closer to justice, right? So that the next generation, the one after that. Right, has a way better set of, of circumstances and opportunities than I had. So I'm not ready to give up on the American dream yet. I feel like I don't have a choice but to, right? Because it's it's I got a younger sister and younger brother. And I um I like to think that in 2021, right, the 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 sort of reckoning that we're living through allows us to do a lot. Like we just we just eliminated cash bail. I mean, it's just the mm -hmm. the, the 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 um Black Lives Agenda that the Lieutenant Governor talked about is just that type of legislation is is fairly unprecedented. And so, you know, I'm um it makes me her the book makes me wonder if the American dream is is um you know is false or is 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 uh exceedingly elusive for for millions of people um who look like me and I'm the type of person that doesn't want to um you know pretend like I don't think what I really think and so I, I do I do struggle with that and it and it's something that now that I'm a public official I think I have to be even more aggressive about uh creating creating a scenario where there's equity and justice for people that you know, notwithstanding, are just not going to have it. That's yeah. that's. Can I can I just jump in, Kelly, for one moment? Because I want to yes. pick up on something that you said, Senator, and it it ties to a question that someone put in the chat about um, inequities in agriculture, and that is something that my office has taken on, not just as the chair of the Governor's Rural Affairs Council, but it's something that I have been passionate about. Most of us come from people, you know, if you're Black in America, you have some relative somewhere typically that has tilled the land and, and has um, worked the land and helped build this country. And in 1920, there were about uh, 2 million Black farmers. And in, 19, in 2020, 100 years later, there's less than 250,000. Black farmers, and it's even a smaller number for Latinx and indigenous farmers. So this concept of owning land that the senators talked about is really critical. And um, 
And we have to do something to address this. And so we are working and it's not just, although urban ag is important, but agriculture is the number one industry in the state of Illinois. It is a $19 billion industry. And yet when you look at all of the different uh, avenues or pipelines to that industry, you do not see black, brown and indigenous people uh, being prepped to go into this industry. Very few, uh, you don't, you don't have the education where people are told it doesn't just mean that you have to be on a farm, that agriculture is also communications and marketing and R&D and, and um, you know, transportation and production and processing. There's so many ways you can get involved. And it's those sorts of things that when we bring, when we talk about our lived experiences and our narratives and our history and our stories to these seats of power, these roles that we have, uh, that's where you can really see that it's not just, you know, in 200 years, uh, no black lieutenant governor. I don't come to this space to just maintain status quo. I come to this space with everything that I am and all the experiences that not just I have had, but those that my parents and my grandparents and great great grandparents have had and the kinds of things that I want to see for my four daughters as they continue and their children's children. This is why we have to be, um, when we talk about caste, we have to make sure that at every level, in every room where decisions are being made, that there are diverse perspectives that represent the reality of communities all throughout our state. And that's what's really important to me, that we lift up those voices and make sure that we make policy that doesn't just repair harm, but that we ensure that future policy does not cause further harm. Oh, I love that. I absolutely love that. We have to do more than repair. And then we can't just walk through the door and be the first. We want to make sure that we're not many. the last. I yes, want to celebrate. Many. I love that there's first. The senator is the first. I'm a first. Yes. We, we have lots to celebrate. I called him and I said, I'm so excited. But I'll you want to see a celebration when there's many, when we don't yes. have to celebrate one. Yeah. Yes. Because that's yes. how we're going to address these issues with the caste system. That's right. That's right. Ruth Bader, oh. uh, uh, Bader Ginsburg was asked, when are they going to be, um, when, when is it going to be enough to have, you know, how many women are going to be enough? And she said, when the Supreme Court has nine. So <laughs> that's when it's going to be enough. I when love it. It's going to be enough when it is, you know, sort of like when the entire Senate is yeah. filled with yeah. Senators Simmons et al. It is, yep. it, it, that's, that's the response, but. Yep, sorry, absolutely. So, uh, I, and I, I love that, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, so there's a question for you, uh, Senator Simmons. How will you represent black people and LGBTQI people outside of your district and potentially hostile districts. Mm -hmm. How can your constituents engage with you at this time? Yeah, um, so it, it's, a, it's a good question. And I will tell you that it is my intention, uh, first and foremost, to serve the residents of the seventh district, particularly those that are disenfranchised, particularly those that have never seen a person who looks like them uh, serving at the state level and who have never heard their voice reflected in any of their concerns. These are the people I'm thinking about literally in the middle of the night when I wake up in the morning, when I go to bed. But you know, the thing about that, Kelly, is that the people in this district have first cousins that live in other parts of the city and, and other parts of the state. And I know this because I may have grown up in the seventh district, but I have first cousins that have been incarcerated out of Inglewood. I got great aunts that have been built out of their retirement in North Lawndale. And I've got great uncles that lost their land further downstate. So I, 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 the struggle is, is, is from way down, you know, by Pulaski all the way up to Waukegan. Um, and, and in some of those, you know, the Lieutenant Governor know way, way better than I do, but in some of those communities, they don't see anybody that looks like them representing them any, at any level of government. Um, and, if, and, if, and if that's the case, then it means that, you know, I've got an even extra responsibility to articulate what that struggle looks like for people who have been disenfranchised and who typically just haven't had their concerns addressed. And if you talk to them, they'll tell you, um, a lot of times they're ready, people think that they're, they're, a lot of people are disillusioned and skeptical. I, a lot of them are ready, they're hungry for leadership. They're waiting for somebody to step up and, and talk about the issues in a way that makes sense to them and are recognizable to them. And so I, I, I feel like it's my job to um, speak to the struggles of the LGBTQ people 
um, that might be down in Cairo or, or other parts of the state and don't, you know, they just don't have anybody down there that understands um, what's happening to them on a personal level, right? We talk, look at this issue with the, tra with the transgender community, right? Mm -hmm. Transgender people of color experience excessive rates of violence that often go under addressed and underreported, right? I can't wait for somebody else from another part of the state to step up and speak on behalf of that community. That, that becomes part of my responsibility mm -hmm. as a person of color and as a member of the, of the LGBT community. And so um, that, that's something I intend to do. And in parts of the states where, you know, I might get a hostile reception. I got, it's funny, I got question, asked that question earlier today. It's something I just don't think about. You know, I, I've, I've, um, I'm getting used to this whole public official talking about yourself thing, but I've, I've just come through a lot of stuff in my own life. Like I come from a family of people who are just powerhouse black women and people that fought. And so like, I have that, I have, I know what it's like to come into a scenario where people are, are just inherently hostile to you, right? Just being a gay person raised in Ronald Reagan's America, right? Like I already just, that is just built into my bones. But the other thing I have is I, I like to think that I have my mother's compassion and I can talk to and work with just about anybody. Um, and I can do so on my own two feet, right? I will not bend down or put my head down or take any mistreatment from anybody, right? Like my humanity is never up for negotiation, but I know how to meet people where they are and I know how to work with them um, and, and, and give them a sense of where I'm coming from. Because I think if people know where you're coming from, typically we let the guard down a little bit um, and they, you know, you'll, win, you'll start to win people over slowly. Um, so I, I like that question, it's just, it's, it's real. That's that's super powerful, and that's something. That's one thing that I that I admire you for. You really stand in. Um, you're a very self possessed person. You have a lot of pride and dignity, and you are open to other people and different uh, perceptions and life experiences and backgrounds. And you can hold space with many people, but it's it's very clear that you uh, have a great deal of respect for yourself and you expect people to engage with you that way and you engage others that way. And yeah. I think that's, um, that's just a beautiful thing to see. Um, so now that we are at 629, so it's almost 630, um, I, we would love to have the Lieutenant Governor close us out and then mm -hmm. Nabila and I will say some final remarks before we close out. Lieutenant Governor? Well, first of all, Kelly and Avila, I just want to thank you for uh, moderating this fantastic and, and really engaging conversation. It's been great to join Senator Mike Simmons in this conversation. And I've heard so many things that made me say, okay, we're going to do some real, like as John Lewis would say, get into some good trouble together. Um, and certainly thank all of you who joined tonight. Um, you know, racism is stressful. The caste system is stressful. And what I said before is it is really a matter of life or death. There are people who are dying early or dying simply because of the color of their skin and the policies that have been created throughout generations that are to, again, keep people in their proverbial place. Mm -hmm. um, I've dealt with it myself. You know, I think about as a young lawyer walking up and I know time is up, but I just wanna say as a young lawyer walking into the courtroom and someone saying, as I got in line to check in with the clerk, oh no, this line is for lawyers. As if I couldn't possibly be a lawyer. Or just two years ago, early on in being Lieutenant Governor, when someone said, you know, the Lieutenant Governor is supposed to be here and give some remarks. And I'm like, yeah, that would be me. There are assumptions that people make because of the color of our skin and lots of other ways that we, uh, identities that we carry in ourselves. And I just challenge everyone as we read this book is to understand again, the harm that has been done because of that. And to, as Senator Simmons said, um, allow people, uh, uh, not allow, but to recognize that each of us are fully human and deserve the respect and the honor of, of being fully human and not backing down from the fact that you deserve to be honored as fully human. So I just have appreciated the conversation. I look forward to working on policies informed by many of you who have joined this conversation. I'd love to hear from you on some things that, that I've talked about or that the Senator has talked about that we can now move forward together. Thank you all. And thank you to Chicago House for hosting. Oh, this was, thank you. Um, and, and, and thank you, Senator, as well. Um, 
th this has been, it, it, it's a wonderful way to end um, our conversations about this book. Um, you, you really did cap it for us. Um, and, and to the book clubbers, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Kelly for again joining me on this uh, 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 on this wonderful ride for the last uh, last six weeks. Um, it's it's been fantastic, and it's 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 just wonderful to see where our conversations uh, will will take us. And I look forward to doing this again um, in in a month or so's time. Um, you all know that uh, that at it, every session I always end up talking about some other book than the book that we're currently reading. Um, and I have to, I have to recommend um, a book to you. Hang on, let me run across the room. This book, <laughs> All right, she's I, really excited about this book. So because you've got because it it picks up on something that the the the, the governor has said and, and our conversation over the last six weeks as well, which is about we have to define ourselves because if we don't define ourselves, they are going to define us. And you know, I walk around saying I am a proud Pakistani Muslim lesbian woman. I'm a lawyer and I'm all of those other things because, and the reason that that comes out of my mouth right at the beginning is that if I don't do it, people are just gonna assume that I'm just, I'm just here to carry the bags and I'm not here to carry anybody's bags. Girl, Woman and Other is an amazing book. It's an amazing book about brown and black women in England. Um, it came out last year, the year before, 2019, it won the, the Booker Prize. I can't put it down. It, like I, I lived the lives of these women and I would highly recommend it to you. It follows through, it, it, it takes us to the next step in this book club. Whereas, you know, we talked about, about the AIDS crisis. We talked about housing with Southside. We talked about caste with Wilkerson's book. I really do recommend this as, you know, if you want to get to know your sisters, you've got to read this book. It's an amazing, amazing, amazing book. Um, um, and then one thing that I wanted to follow up um, uh, from the Lieutenant Governor's comments earlier about, you know, the number of names, the list of names is absolutely endless it seems endless the guardian in uh, in britain did um did a series where um it, it went along the lines of you know say their name but instead of saying their name what they did was they did a portrait they did a portrait of every black or brown individual that was that yes. that suffered at the hands of um of of, of law enforcement um, and that died. And, um, you know, it just built, and look, I've even got the goosebumps talking, it built and built, and it is such a massive project. And the road is so long to get to that point of equity, um, but we have to start somewhere and we have to start with these conversations. And I'm so grateful to all three of you uh, for, jo for joining me on this journey. Thank you so much. What a fantastic conversation. Um, I am oh, so hopeful. This makes me so joyful. So thank you all again. And thanks to all of you who tuned in. Yep. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Be well.